so safely, if perhaps shakily, launched and on to our gardening spot. <coughs> In our last two gardening programmes, Susan sent up heartfelt pleas for rain. Well, we've had plenty of rain in the last month. So, Susan, how has it all been? Uh, has it been all that you've hoped for? And what have you got in store for us this month, coming month? Well, yes, we have needed the rain, actually, and it's quite surprising how much um, the plants have benefited, um, and the weeds, of course. But, um, no, we're always... Gardeners do need rain. Most of us harvest water, uh, rainwater, so we, we are able to provide some um, natural resources for our plants. Um, but certainly, it, it is necessary, or else you, you, you end up with a garden like a desert. But the, the lighter evenings, too, have helped. Um, I, I don't know how many of our listeners um, have been inspired by Chelsea. I, I know I have. And June is always such a busy month in the garden. There's always so much going on. And so the lighter evenings, even if it's an hour, you can spend out there and do some weeding. And with all that rain, the weeds are coming up like butter. Wonderful. <laughs> but... I've noticed my strawberries, my, goose, my, my gooseberries are plumping up very nicely in the rain. My strawberries are coming on a treat as well. And the one thing I do, ha that I do do with my strawberries is to put some straw around them. So when the fruit actually um, comes on stream, at least the berries aren't in the soil. And it also deters the slugs as well. Although I was talking to some of the um, team earlier and they were, had problems with slugs. Slug gel is something that... It doesn't kill the slugs, but it certainly deters them. And so that's something, if you're not into killing things, well, that's not a bad idea. Rhubarb has been in season for a couple of months now. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, excuse, <coughs> excuse me. And there are lots of new slants from cooks on how to cook rhubarb from sorbet to muffins and all sorts of stuff. But there's nothing like a good old fashioned crumble from my point of view. And add some nice chopped ginger for a bit of spice and some cream or custard even if you like it. Blueberries are in flower and mine are doing really well actually. There again the, the, the berries look as if they're going to be quite plump this year. And I've got currants, red, black and white currants and also I'm growing bilberries for the first time this year which reminds me of my childhood and those moorland tang, tangy berries that so tiny and you always ended up with blue teeth, blue tongue and everything else but they were just so tasty. So anyway, I'll let you know how they come on later on. There again, bilberries, blueberries and things like that are ericaceous. So they prefer a, a lime-hating soil. I put mine in ericaceous compost. I use rainwater, not tap water, and I also make sure I give them an ericaceous feed as well. The bees are buzzing around. Herb, my herb garden is full of bees. I've got wonderful sage, rosemary, thyme, chives, all in glorious technicolour, all in se essential gr ingredients for the kitchen, for soups, salads and baking. I love ba basil and coriander and tarragon particularly, although I can't grow basil outside in this British climate, despite the fact that you can get outdoor basil seeds, but I, I can't get there. But I must admit, those three ingredients plus perhaps garlic and lemon, are the very things I take to my desert island. I can't do without them in my kitchen. And my little kitchen garden is outside my back door, so I can nip out and get some chives or some mint or some basil or whatever it is. There's nothing like fresh herbs in your food. It adds a lot of taste. But the other thing that gives you taste, and it's not terribly usual, um, are the edible flowers that you can grow in the garden. Borage, well, we've all put borage on top of our pims, haven't we, actually? But you can actually grow it in, uh, you can actually spread it on salads, too. The blue certainly adds an awful lot of colour. Geraniums, scented, but you can put those, the leaves, uh, you can chop those up and put them in salads. So they've got a very citrus taste, but use them sparingly, because they can be quite strong. An unusual one is calendula, or as you and I know it, pot marigold. They're very pretty orange flowers too, and you can just sprinkle those on salads, or apparently, and I've only learned this recently, you can actually use them in, in, instead of saffron, which, yes, saffron's very orange, but it's also very expensive, so to, lose, to use pot marigolds might be an alternative. 
they are quite peppery and they, they too are quite good in, in soups. Nasturtiums, seeds, leaves and flowers are all used for, for either decoration or cooking and they too are quite peppery but tasty. From tasty flowers to scented flowers, I seem to be dwelling on flowers this year but I, I do think sometimes it's quite nice to get away from the vegetables. I've just planted up my pots. I do wait until the last frost or the danger of a last frost and so often it's the end of May or so before I do do my pots. But outside my on my patio I've got some wonderfully scented flowers, Acidanthra, which are a little bit like gladioli. I've got stocks, always a good favourite. Summer jasmine, which I bought from a very cheap supermarket actually, and it's beautifully scented. I'm really quite pleased with it. Sweet peas, of course, but they're quite greedy in terms of nutrition, so you have to be careful with those or else you might have a failure. And then petunias, all these wonderful petunias that are coming on stream now with scent and beautifully um, petaled, multi-petaled. So there are a lot of really lovely flowers that you can have outside your near your back door or your front door wherever you're sitting having your drink in the evenings that are really um, quite beneficial to you and also the bees who do like open petal flowers. In terms of vegetables I'm going to have to plant my cauliflower soon, my dwarf beans which are coming up very well in my um, cold frame and my courgettes but there again I wait until possibly the end of June so that I can avoid the frosts. So, happy gardening, folks. Right. Um, uh, I, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, oh, you had certainly brought me back to childhood days in the west of Ireland when you talked about the bilberries. <laughs> we we yes. roamed far and wide and came oh, back yes. stained for yes, days. You yes, you yes, yes, yes. But they were absolutely wonderful. Delicious. Yeah, the other odd thing that was, yesterday I joined a group of people who were being shown around the geology of the North Umbrian coast up at Craster. We walked along between Craster between Craster and Howick. Um, and when our guide showed us some a 350 million year old fossil of some horse tail we all the gardeners in the group gave a mighty collective groan uh, it was obviously the bane of their lives even 350 million years later have you had any problems with this? oh yes um, oh. horsetail it's been known you can find it down the bottom of mine shafts right, right. It, its roots <laughs> are so deep and it is very difficult to get rid of unless right. you use some really pernicious weed killer which is not advisable right. on your vegetable garden right. um, you just have to keep digging yes, right. um, that's all you can do but it is it, it, it's like a dinosaur it's that old well, it, it's yes. 350 million, million years I'm not surprised yes you find it and in people the, obviously have failed totally to <laughs> 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 over that time yes, right. yes just keep digging Good. Okay. <laughs> well thank you very much and we look forward very much to next month as, as always thank you very much okay. thank you